There's been a lot of discussion this morning about making schools better places for children, or uh, as Seymour Saracen said, more productive contexts for learning. And one of my recent heroes and gurus is Loris Malaguzzi, and he says that things about children and for children are only learned from children. So a number of the lessons that I'm going to be sharing with you today come from my experiences of learning from ch and with children. A couple of years ago, I heard President Botstein of Bard College, Leon Botstein, one of the great public intellectuals of our time, um, make a comment that's really driven a lot of my thinking and a great deal of my work ever since. And he said that young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. And it's incumbent upon all of us to build upon that capacity for intensity. Otherwise, it manifests itself in ennui or um, discipline problems or misbehavior. But kids are capable of a great deal, and it's incumbent upon us to build upon that capacity for intensity. Now, I'm sympathetic to those of us and those people outside the education community who want to make schools better places for children. However, history didn't begin with Bill Gates or Joel Klein or Michael Bloomberg or Michelle Rhee or Barack Obama. They don't have a monopoly on truth. What they do have is contempt for us and for the children we serve and for our colleagues. While they offer one form of education for their children, they prescribe obedient schools for other people's children, particularly those who are poor and of color. You know, tougher is not an effective learning theory. They want the damned kids to just do school better, quicker, and at a lower cost. You know, the end game is replacing teachers with YouTube videos created by volunteers. This week, Bill Gates descended into Charlie Sheen-like madness <laughs> when he told the National Governors Association that extreme budget cuts and increasing class sizes will actually be good for children. Not his children, of course, but other people's children. Um, this is the first time in history where philanthropists were actually calling for the deprivation of the helpless and the young. Innovation isn't a synonym for cheaper. What these folks are proposing, I like to call Reform TM, where Reform TM is their one model of what school reform looks like. You know, uniforms, endless test preps, joyless curricula, scripted lesson plans, children chanting meaningless, meaningless propaganda slogans about achievement, but not the sort of educational environment that all children deserve and that they provide for their own. And what's worse about reform TM is that it ignores all the real potential for doing great things on behalf of kids, for all of us to improve our practice, to raise our games. You know, and when the test scores don't rise quickly enough, they prescribe that we yell louder or lengthen the school day, or in Texas, offer teachers a dollar more a day because they've been artificially repressing the scores just because they haven't gotten that 180 bucks a year. Um, and where, you know, for too many kids, art, music, science, social studies suffers from what I call the Sasquatch effect. People have heard it exists in other schools, they've just never seen it themselves. <laughs> I asked, last year I asked several dozen teacher education students to describe the science education they saw in the elementary schools where there was student teaching. Not a single one of them had ever seen it taught. They had heard about it, but it had never actually happened. You know, Reform TM is insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And when it fails, as it predictably will, smarty pants like Michelle Rhee can then stand up and say, see, someone even as clever as the great me can't fix this damn system. Let's get rid of it. Let's have more charters and vouchers. Now, we know what to do. We must do better. We can do better. I'm holding in my hand a book written by a school principal and teacher in New York City named Angelo Petri called The Schoolmaster of the Great City. This book identifies and solves every single problem in urban education. It was also published in 1917. We stand on the shoulders of giants. We need to learn from the giants in our own field because frankly, how can we expect our politicians to take geniuses like Dennis Litke seriously, people who have dedicated their lives to making schools more hospitable to the intentions of children, that have great results on behalf of kids? How can we expect our leaders to take them seriously when we seek wisdom from 
get-rich-quick schemes and pop business books that you could buy in airport gift shops. We need to learn from the giants in our own field. One of the giants in this field that, as Sylvia said, I had the great pleasure of working with for 20 plus years is Seymour Papert, the father of educational computing, the gentleman who taught Piaget how to understand how children learn mathematics. And Papert and I spent three years creating an alternative learning environment inside a state prison for teenagers in Maine. And the examples that I'm going to share with you come from working with this population of kids who were the most at risk members of society. The kids have been told over and over and over again that they were incompetent, that they were inadequate, that they were incapable of learning, that they were damaged, that they weren't loved by society. And you'll see what these children were capable of. You'll see their remarkable capacity for intensity and their intellectual gifts and their creative talents. If we're serious about innovation in education, we have to be willing to change everything. Not just the low-hanging fruit, not just the single variable, not just lengthening the school day and doing everything else the same. We have to be willing to question all of the assumptions. What if school was the best seven hours of a kid's day? How about you wake up Monday morning and ask yourself, how do I make this the best seven hours of the kid's life? What if we were freed of all assessment and curriculum requirements? We had the great blessing in Maine that Governor King at the time and the state legislature and the Commissioner of Education freed us of all assessment and curriculum requirements because they recognized with a population of kids who had been failing over and over and over again, many of whom hadn't been in school since they were in the fifth grade, that doing the same thing louder wouldn't achieve a different result. And that if you actually wanted to think about the future of education, maybe we should abandon some of our prejudices and fetishes of the past. What if there were indeed no discipline problems? In three years of work with some of the most at-risk members of our society, we didn't have a single discipline problem that required a kid to be removed from the classroom. This was in a facility where there was an emergency on average once a day where an alarm sounded and burly men busted in and threw a kid in shackles and dragged them out of the room. But when we were able to create an environment that put the needs and passions and talents and expertise and curiosity of the children ahead of some arbitrary list of stuff, we were able to create an environment where kids not only learned but wanted to be there and wanted to learn even more. We can have high standards without standardization. Go. So we had this environment that was actually in a trail or was a temporary building. We had, it was multi-age, project-based. We had kids from 13 to 20 years old, interdisciplinary. The goal was to acquaint or reacquaint these kids with the power and joy of learning and their power as learners. Kids were treated to five hours of uninterrupted time each day to work on personally meaningful projects. And obviously, these were kids with low socioeconomic status, um, an incredibly high percentage of special education classifications, poor school experiences, rough lives. And we were working with a transient population in a punitive environment that viewed collaboration and risk taking as troublemaking. But despite that, kids were able to engage in a wide variety of really thoughtful projects that, that demonstrate their capacity for intensity and their intellectual capabilities. We had to turn school on its head to do this. In traditional curricular contexts, you do things like projects or themes as a way of tricking kids or holding their interest long enough for them to develop the list of skills that we want them to acquire. We turned this upside down and said that if kids are engaged in projects that matter to them, and in some cases projects that didn't take a class period but took days or weeks or months, then the skills that are required to satisfy their own desires, their own objectives for those projects, would be developed within the context of doing something a whole lot more meaningful. Kids produced radio programs that have appeared on This American Life. There are links to them on the website. They built guitars and ultralight airplanes. They programmed computers. They wrote newsletters. They, they acted. They built telescopes and cameras obscura, programmed video games, etc. This is a desk of a great intellectual, someone who's got an active mind, someone who's involved in a great deal of, of, of pursuits at the same time. This is also a kid who had been institutionalized for one reason or another since he was seven years old. Everything in his permanent record said he couldn't read and write. We had plenty of evidence that this wasn't true, not the least of which 
Um, he was programming computers and installing software and, and things of that sort. But we didn't make a big deal about it. This kid was incredibly gifted at building things, of, of engineering. He could have conversations with MIT professors about material science and about physics. And right before his 18th birthday, he sat down at his computer and he worked for three solid days on something. And our only rule was you have to be doing something. So he was doing something. And when he was done, he pushed the print button on his word processor, pulled out a sheath of paper, and handed us a 13,000 word autobiography. And when we said, Michael, we were told you couldn't read and write, he said, and I quote, oh yeah, I could read and write. I just wasn't a very strong reader, and I didn't like reading about puppies. <laughs> and then he mumbled, I liked reading about NASA, and walked off. So somewhere around first grade, he got into a pissing contest with the teacher over the puppy story, and he decided he wouldn't learn the rest of the time he was sentenced to school. And this kid was, I'm going to skip some examples, this kid was involved in some unbelievably, unbelievable engineering projects that really would sort of challenge what we think kids are capable of. We have examples of kids inventing a phonograph and talking about using units of measure spontaneously in their work in ways that teachers would kill to get a kid to do, where he was building a phonograph out of Lego and trying to get it to, to work at 33 and a third RPMs and had to deal with friction and gearing. And he decided to look at the grooves on the record at a certain magnification because we had a digital microscope that was available to him. We didn't have a curriculum that said you had to do this. We had a list of prompts that said, here are some good ideas. And this kid walked in at 15 years old and said, I want to do something hard, something nobody's ever done before which is a very unique stance for a kid who's been classified with a variety of learning disabilities. But our reputation had preceded him. He knew this was a place where he could do things that were hard. Because if you have a good prompt, a challenge, or motivation, appropriate materials, sufficient time, and a supportive culture that includes a range of expertise, you can go further than you think you're capable of going yourself. We have opportunities for teachers and children to learn together, not just stand on opposite banks of the river. Project ideas are everywhere. They're around us every day. There are learning invitations in the air, in the newspaper, on TV, in radio. I was in the Papal Palace of Avignon, France one summer, and I saw these wooden kits that were called medieval machines of war. I thought, oh, the kids are going to love this. And it was a model kit for building a trebuchet. It was incredibly complicated to build. It had all this balsa wood and gluing that was involved in measurement and cutting. And the instructions were in French. <laughs> but sure enough, the kids built this trebuchet. And they documented their work. And one kid was shooting video of it. Thank God he was at about a 45 degree angle. And the kids were going to launch the trebuchet in the classroom for the first time. And the projectile was a marble. <laughs> and it went something like this. Three, two, one, shit! As the marble went through a steel filing cabinet at the other end of the room. Because, <laughs> you know, science is messy. Um, and these kids never, these kids never touched the, the, the trebuchet again. You know, one day one of the kids asked John Stetson, who was a volunteer working with us, can you help me make a guitar? They built an electric guitar strapping you know, electronics to a piece of wood. He said, that's not what I mean. I mean a real guitar. And kids then spent 500 hours working on creating these absolute works of art. These kids who we were told had impulse control problems, who had short attention spans and attention deficit disorder. And a funny thing happens when you build a guitar. You want to learn how to play it. And then you can use what you, what you've, the music that you've made to score your history project or your science report or your class play. We need to, to embrace all the expertise that's in our classroom and recognize that, that the visitors to our classroom are experts as well. We had a Jewish professor of aeronautics who taught African drumming to the kids. I don't know why, but he was welcome. He came in and taught these kids to drum twice a week, and it was wonderful for them. We need to create environments that are coercion free, where children do what they do because it matters to them. And we need to remove all of the stakes. And I'm going to end on this because I th only see a couple seconds left on the clock. I wrote an article called if you, Everything I Learned About Reading Instruction, I, Everything I Know About Reading Instruction I Learned from Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and it was based on the thesis, the question of how is it that Oprah Winfrey can get millions of housewives to read Toni Morrison and you can't teach kids to read? You remember when you were in school, reading was something you, you were taught until you could read? 
Now it's something we teach from cradle to grave, apparently, and no one learns to read. We had kids who were, who were illiterate, who were desperate not to be, and kids who we were told were illiterate who weren't. And if we said to the kids, read a book, any book in our wondrous library, and create some artifact about that book, demonstrating you had read it, you could invite your friends to a pizza party we're going to have. And some of the kids said to me, well, I don't like to speak in front of others. I said, well, great, fine, don't come. Every kid read, every kid talked. They were part of the community of practice of readers. But if we had graded or ranked or sorted these children, we would have created a barrier that would have required a kid who was reading Dr. Seuss when other kids were reading Melville to feel self-conscious about where he was, and he wouldn't do it. The most violent facility in the prison was the, was the literacy classroom, where they would put a couple dozen 17-year-old boys and grunt phonemes at them until they threw a chair through the window. If we remove the stakes for learning, kids will feel better about what they do, and they'll learn better, and they'll make greater contributions. I, I got it. I'm out of time. So with that, I will thank, thank you, and hopefully we'll get a chance to continue this conversation in the future. I'm going to end with the four words of advice that I share with every audience I have the privilege of speaking to in every school where I have the opportunity to work, and that's less us, more them. Any time you're thinking about intervening on behalf of the education of someone else, you need to ask yourself, is there a way to shift more agency to the learner and, and less from us? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.